was a presidential kidnapping and assassination video. It showed a pickup truck, Trump flags flapping in the wind from it, and on its tailgate there was a sadistic fantasy illustration of President Biden bound and gagged and thrown in the flatbed of the truck, and the video was posted by Donald Trump, and Donald Trump is a living and mortal threat to everyone and everything in this country, and from whom it is not an unrealistic extrapolation to conclude that that was a stochastic attempt to get Joe Biden, President of the United States, kidnapped, or assassinated, a stochastic attempt at assassination by Trump. And it was part of an orgy of stochastic threats made by Trump over the Easter weekend. Photos of the daughter of the judge in his trial for criminalized use of hush money to interfere with an election. The prosecution had to ask the judge himself last night to include his own daughter in the gag order in that case. There were more Trump comparisons of himself to Christ. One article literally headlined the crucifixion of Trump. Another titled something supernatural is happening with Trump. And by the way, Trump is competing with his own soon to be disbarred lawyer criminals, John Eastman and Jeffrey Clark. Eastman's own children portrayed him as Christ over Easter weekend as well. There were more than 100 posts of vengeance and hate from Trump on Easter Sunday. More social media posts from an ex-New York cop, now Long Island congressman, with hundreds of police shown marching behind a cross. And the warning from this fascist ex-cop Desposito, quote, don't cross us. It all makes me again ask a chilling question I first posed months ago. Had any of Trump's various coup attempts succeeded in 2020. If any of the coup attempts Trump is planning now for this November or this December or next January, should any of them succeed? Exactly what is Trump's plan or what are the plans of his thugs and gangs and cultists and psychotics and death fetishists and militias and God and gun lunatics? What are their plans For the actual president, he usurps when he usurps him. You steal the presidency, as Trump tried to do in 2020, in a legal fashion, in an illegal fashion, in a nonviolent fashion, then in a violent fashion, and you succeed. You have a problem. You have the rightfully, democratically chosen president-elect, and you detain him? You keep him incommunicado? You try him for fabricated crimes because you have declared his legal election illegal? The parallel situation ensues this upcoming election. Biden wins by four electoral votes or 400 electoral votes and Trump cries fraud and his mob believes him or pretends to. It no longer matters which. And Trump finds sufficient muscle in the militias or the police or parts of the military or the Secret Service or some combination, not all of them, but enough that he can seize Joe Biden and and do what with Joe Biden? Well, this weekend past has finally given us that answer. Have the mob the pickup truck mob with the giant Trump flags flying in exact reproduction and recreation of Nazi Germany and every other dictatorship of every ideology of every century in every country, you have the mob grab Joe Biden and tie him up and throw him in the back of a truck. If they forget how they're supposed to do it, there's now a picture of it. The hidden plan is hidden no more. This is what Trump wants in real life. This is what Trump has now conveyed to his paramilitary squads, his he and its members hope death squads. And if they need to practice, there is that picture on the back of that truck. But if they need to practice, Trump wants them to go after Judge Engeron, not Judge Mershon, but Judge Mershon's daughter and Jack Smith. Because there are a lot of pickup trucks. See, there was one pickup 
truck that Trump showed. And then there was at least one other one shared on social media by an Idaho state legislator named Heather Scott, who has openly defended white supremacism on social media. And that truck has the same illustration, the same picture of Joe Biden bound and seemingly in the back of a pickup truck. It is yet another reminder said Kristen Welker on Meet the Press, somehow capping the week-long self-destruction of NBC News over the Ronna McDaniel hiring, capping it with something actually worse, that we are covering this election against the backdrop of a deeply divided nation. Television journalism, much of print and digital journalism, has failed. Kristen Welker has failed. The language itself of political journalism has failed. It is not factually mistaken to call us a deeply divided nation right now, but it wrongly paints this country in exactly the same way, the same phrase, a deeply divided nation, would have done so during the Civil War. Or in exactly the same way that the Ukraine under siege now by Russia is a deeply divided nation. Or in exactly the same way the Spain attacked by international fascism in the 1930s, was a deeply divided nation. There is right and there is wrong. And there are Kristen Welker and NBC News and most of TV news, and they are so buried beneath rituals and superstitions that they have mistaken for ethics and rules that they can no longer tell the difference between right and wrong. They no longer recognize that they are supposed to take sides in that particular both sidesist nightmare. That in this kind of deeply divided nation, stick with the people who are right. They do not think for a moment that the freedom of the press is not an end unto itself, that it exists to keep a nation free, that it exists to say, We are covering this election against the backdrop of a deeply divided nation where the candidate of one party can publicly broadcast an image of the other candidate bound and gagged, and we in the media can let the bastard get away with it. But they will not say that. They really do think that if the bottom falls out of democracy or if Trump kicks through the floor of democracy, they can somehow hold up their press passes and somehow their lives will be unaffected by the fascism to come. And they can still get seen in spotted in Politico playbook instead of seen in the Stephen Miller detention camp for political re-education. NBC News has, as the kids say, lost the plot. That if NBC News disappeared tomorrow, there would be much good journalism lost, but much more hollow, ritualistic, flatulent, ersatz journalism ended. Project this nightmare. The Republican releases that video, literally a hostage video involving the president of the United States and then a Republican politician in Idaho publishes a still photograph of the same image of the bound and gagged president of the United States. And this happens during the 1972 presidential campaign or the 1992 presidential campaign or the 2012 presidential campaign or the Democrat in any of those campaigns does it. It would have been the only story in the nation, on television, on radio, in newspapers, online, for days, for weeks, for months, for the rest of the campaign, or until the candidate who posted the video withdrew or was removed by his party. Instead, today it has become fodder for the both sidesist mill when anybody bothered to cover it. My God, and it is amazing and nauseating and terrifying to say this. At least NBC mentioned it in passing. And wait, there's worse. Because there was something worse. 
Worse, not because it was more violent nor dramatic, but because it, it was neither. Worse, even though Trump's hand was not obvious in it, but just as Trump's Biden bound in the pickup truck video marked the dropping of yet another pretense that that isn't what they have planned, so did another story nobody covered. It was another, oh, here we go, moment, when the fig leaf fell off and it left three ugly Trumps hanging there exposed for the world to see. Small ones at that. Headline in the magazine, The American Conservative. New issue. Trump 2028. Subhead. The 22nd Amendment is an arbitrary restraint on presidents who serve non-consecutive terms and on democracy itself. As I said, oh, here we go. This has been building for a while. The Republican Party on the verge of extinction and instead suddenly now poised via the proverbial perfect storm to corrupt all elections in this nation and strangle the Democrats by simply effectively strangling democracy. The Republican Party has seemingly joked and tweaked and triggered the left with variations on this idea ever since Trump mused in 2018 that he was owed some sort of third term, because his first one had been preoccupied with defending his um, crimes. So he didn't really get a first term. So this second term would only really be his first term, and his third term would only really be his second term. See? Then there was the jokey animation of a Trump 2020 campaign banner, followed by a Trump 2024 campaign banner, followed by a Trump 2028 campaign banner, followed by a Trump 2032 campaign banner, and on and on and on, until it was a 102-year-old Trump running in the year 2048. Nobody was wondering if he'd be dead by then and running from a coffin, because after all, they were only doing this to own the libs. Except they weren't. They are softening up the opposition... And the rest of the media did not notice this story. They are softening up the opposition in order to elect Trump in November on the assumption that he will be eligible to run for a third term in 2028. And after that, God knows what. Seriously, as serious as death, yours. Quote, Trump's reemergence as the Republican nominee in 2024 is a triumph of democracy. Not only did Trump secure the nomination following his defeat in 2020, a rather incredible feat in and of itself, but did so in spite of every obstacle the mainstream media, the Republican establishment, and the lawfare apparatus have put in his way. You see where this is going. Trump overcame obstacles. Or if you prefer... Trump overcame mediocrity and weaponized stupidity and hatred and some kind of blackmail against many of the leading Republicans. Therefore, the Constitution should not apply to him. Just him. Especially those pesky term limits in the 22nd Amendment. Republican primary voters chose him, writes the American conservative, quote, because they damn well felt like it. Well, about 75% of them so far damn well felt like it. So far, a total of 13,475,006 of them did, a total which would not even win him Florida, Texas, and Ohio. But I'm diverging here. I'm interrupting the author's termination of the Constitution. The 22nd Amendment, two full terms per president or one and a half if you are serving out another president's term, quote, sounds reasonable enough, especially in light of FDR's hold on the office. Yet those who supported the amendment more than 70 years ago could not have foreseen the prospect of a one-term president who lost the office, but who later regained it in a subsequent election. The author then immediately cites the time it happened with Grover Cleveland all the way back in 1892. The author leaves out that while he may see the Grover Cleveland story as something from prehistory, when dinosaurs still had the vote or something, the 22nd Amendment to the Constitution of the United States of America was, in fact, introduced 
in 1947 by a Michigan congressman named Earl Michener. And he, Earl Michener was 16 years old and preparing to go to the University of Michigan Law School when Grover Cleveland was elected and who just in his lifetime, Congressman Michener had not only seen Cleveland reelected after four years in the wilderness, but Michener had also seen former President Theodore Roosevelt try for a third non-consecutive term in 1912. And Michener had seen the Republican bid to draft former President Calvin Coolidge to run for a third non-consecutive term instead of President Hoover in 1932. And he had seen the former President Hoover try for nomination for a second non-consecutive term in 1936 and then again in 1940. And he had seen Franklin Roosevelt run for a third term and then a fourth. And he'd seen William Jennings Bryan get the Democratic nomination in 1896 and 1900, and having not had enough, run for it again in 1908 and begin to try to run for it for a fourth time in 1912. Michener, the congressman behind presidential term limits, only saw all that unfold. All those ex-presidents and presidential nominees who would not go away. Michener alone saw that all happen in his own lifetime most of which spent in Congress. But once again, I'm interrupting the American conservative narrative here that Trump is unique and the laws don't apply to him and the Constitution doesn't apply to him. And if it does, they'll just change it because, well, to paraphrase the author here, because they damn well feel like it. Of the audacity that the Constitution has in prohibiting letting Trump run again in 2028, despite the fact that he's so special. Quote, this is plainly unfair. Even though the uniqueness the American conservative bestows upon Trump, he was elected, he was not reelected, he tried to overthrow democracy, he failed even at that. Even though that uniqueness is rather akin to, we should break the rules for him. He shot a guy on Fifth Avenue and they applauded. The author promptly uses for support two two-term presidents who doubted that the 22nd Amendment and the, quote, artificial limits it places on voter choice were correct, even though those two presidents are Reagan, who love him or hate him, won his two elections first by 512 electoral votes. He didn't get 512 electoral votes. That was his margin of victory. And then the second time, he won by only 315 electoral votes. The other two-term president, who they say doesn't like the 22nd Amendment, was Barack Obama, who won his two elections, first by 198 electoral votes, and then by 126 electoral votes in what, to borrow NBC's phrase, when it would have actually been true and not pitiful, we were holding those elections against the backdrop of a deeply divided nation. And oh, by the way, Reagan had gone into mental decline by the second full year of his second term. But here I am again having the nerve to interrupt the launching of the trial balloon to see if we can make Trump elected by a total of 79,646 specific voters in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, if we can make him somehow into Reagan times Obama times FDR with just a smidge of Grover Cleveland added in for false uniqueness. This writer is busily trying to slip a lifetime dictator who got in despite losing the popular vote, and I'm busily harshing his buzz and slowing down the snake oil spiel. Back to the snake oil already in progress. To quote again, Trump, however, makes an even more forceful ethical argument against the 22nd Amendment and for its repeal. If a man who was once president returns after a series of years to stand again for the office and prove so popular as to earn a second non-consecutive term, as Trump seems bound to, to deny him the right to run for a second consecutive term cuts against basic fair play, unquote. Ah, once again, the familiar no fair argument that has dominated the Supreme Court for literally what? A couple of days. 
if by 2028 voters feel Trump has done a poor job, they can pick another candidate. But if they feel he has delivered on his promises, why should they be denied the freedom to choose him once more? Unquote. Well, I'd like to note that if he really has delivered on his promises, what makes you think that those voters would get the chance to deny him another term or a fourth one after that? or that there'd ever be another election again. There follows in this piece some hurried sophistry, quote, don't let questions of Trump's age in four years fool you, and his ability to walk in a straight line, ha ha ha, and how in 2032 he'd only be 86, which would be Biden's age in 2028, 86, tanned, ready, and rested. Let's just cancel the 2032 election now and give him four terms. That's only fair, isn't it? Isn't that freedom to violate the Constitution? The best part of the American conservative piece positing that Trump deserves a theoretical third term, even though it's illegal, is how fluidly the author, having not come close to proving his case, then concludes he has proved his case and in a slam dunk. And so shut up and enjoy it. Quote, conservatives have gritted their teeth for years as the left, in their hatred of Trump, has attempted to pervert the meaning of the 22nd Amendment. Unquote. Which Democrats haven't. Because you can't pervert the meaning of the 22nd Amendment. It's more like a math problem. And, by the way, if Democrats had wanted to pervert the meaning of the 22nd Amendment, they would have found a pretext to run Obama for a third term in 2016 or in 2020 or now or four years from now. Quoting again, the case for repealing the 22nd Amendment is far more straightforward. As with prohibition, it is simply a matter of finding the will to get rid of a bad idea that needlessly limits Americans' freedom. Trump 2028! Exclamation point. So, this guy is saying it would be a triumph of the will? Like the Laney Riefenstahl Adolf Hitler film from 1935? Got it. You know, you can't spell triumph of the will without T-R-U-M-P. On that one little point mentioned only at the end of that thousand-word pipe bomb, written with the matter-of-factness of Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal about eating starving babies, you may have noticed that there is nothing in there about that tiny detail, the actual repealing of the 22nd Amendment. Nothing about process or the necessary legislation or the votes in the states, nothing like that, because it is an afterthought. Because to the Trumpists, to MAGA, to the fascists, it is an afterthought. Repealing the amendment is an afterthought. The author did mention how the left did try to pervert the 14th Amendment against electing insurrectionists by, you know, reading it, and how the Republicans responded by simply having their theocratic Supreme Court ignore the 14th Amendment, the way they ignored the Second Amendment for three decades. The Roberts Court disqualification vote against the 14th and its invention of a non-existent congressional action required to implement the 14th when in fact the 14th insists that there must be congressional action to override the 14th, that is the green light for the very simple Republican plan if they elect Trump this autumn and he isn't dead by 2028 and they want to run him again. They just do it. They just do it. Like they're just doing it this time. And they dare you to sue. They dare you to stop them. Hey, Who knows? Maybe this time you'll get lucky and you can find some other Supreme Court of the United States that would rule in favor of (laughs) the Constitution. They run him in 2028. They, to again use the author's phrase, because they damn well feel like it. In 2028, they string out the nominating process just long enough so that the court cases don't really become relevant until late spring or summer. And when their Supreme Court finally gets around to it in July or August, 
At 2028 convention time, the court will have to tisk tisk the political system and say that to strike dear re-elected non-consecutive Trump from the ballot at such a late date would be an unthinkable denial of the rights of millions of fascist voters, some of whom were five when he first declared for the nomination. Their right under the American Reich to vote for Trump because of the Constitution's no fair rule. As to the other detail not mentioned in the article, in the American conservative, the pesky little constitutional grandfather clause in which you cannot restrict nor expand the rights of anyone already doing whatever you just changed, just like you can't prosecute somebody for something they did in 1996 that you only made a crime in 2024. That little grandfather clause that even if you did repeal or simply ignore the 22nd Amendment, it would not apply to Trump. It would not grant him the right to run for a third term. Well, it would just have to give way to the overarching constitutional premise of the no fair rule. Grandfather clause? What does that have to do with this? This is the people's will. It's not fair. It's democracy. And what about Barack Obama, who would suddenly be eligible? who in 2028 would be just 67 years old and suddenly eligible for a third term? What about Bill Clinton? who in 2028 would still be two months younger than Trump? Oh, sorry. The new ignoring of the 22nd Amendment only applies to presidents who've served non-consecutive terms. Those guys are not not eligible. Only anti-democracy, treasonous, mass-murdering, terrorist, scumbag, sexual assaulters who lost re-election and then tried to insurrect Only they can run for one more term than everybody else because that's just fair. Am I right? This is where we are. The former president, insane, murderous, criminally narcissistic, the Ted Bundy of politicians, is promoting and distributing stochastic kidnapping and assassination threats against the incumbent president whom he hopes to unseat in an upcoming election. His minions are now laying the groundwork for him to take, and I do mean take, not one term, but two. And the news network, whose executives weren't trained in the supposedly vapid world of television news, the ink-stained wretches of the New York Times and the Philadelphia Inquirer and Politico, now running NBC News, the ones who thought Ronna McDaniel had unsuspected depth, They have moved on in the span of one week to dismissing this attempt to reduce America to rubble on November 5th and then make sure Trump can stick around to light the rubble on fire again on November 7th, 2028. They have moved on to dismissing all of this to instead highlight the plight of the real danger to America, the plight of the real victims here themselves, the folks at NBC News. Kristen Welker especially. We are covering this election against the backdrop of a deeply divided nation. My God, Kristen Welker, it must be hell in there. Could you use an extra week of vacation? Can I send in paratroopers with pina coladas? The guardrails of democracy have long since failed us. The one labeled media turned out to not only be not a guardrail, turned out to not only be made out of paper mache, but it turned out to have been made out of paper mache made out of old porous copies of the New York Times. And Trump is busy setting them ablaze while 81 writers and editors at NBC decide whether the correct phrase was the backdrop of a deeply divided nation or the context of a deeply divided nation. Let's go have lunch and then we'll meet and discuss it again. In point of fact, it is the democracy itself that has failed us, at least for the moment. I don't know if there are fixes to be made to it now, or if we have to personally, individually act as if we are on our own out here. And I don't even know, I don't even begin to know what that would mean or what that would look like. 
But if we let one violence-obsessed, murderous guy running for president publish a video of a drawing of the other guy running for president, trundled up in ropes and thrown in the back of a pickup truck on the way to being hidden somewhere or ransomed or kidnapped or assassinated, and the best response democracy can come up with is, we are covering this election against the backdrop of a deeply divided nation. Democracy is either going to have to, as they said in Book of Mormon, man up, or we are going to have to do it ourselves. And by the way, that banal, milk toast sounding piece in the American conservative, you know, the one I just quoted from in Growing Horror, Trump 2028, the 22nd Amendment is an arbitrary restraint on presidents who serve non-consecutive terms. I have deliberately to this point left out the author's name because it is the one laugh I would like to offer you, I would like to leave you with, the one faint ephemeral giggle that suggests maybe all is not lost, just 99.9% of it is lost. The author's name is Peter. His last name is spelled T-O-N-G-U-E-T-T-E. He also, does Peter T-O-N-G-U-E-T-T-E, writes with some success about films. My not inconsiderable research in that field suggests his name is actually pronounced Tungit. I, however, will cling to the hope that given his self-congratulatory anti-constitutional fascism, Peter T-O-N-G-U-E-T-T-E actually pronounces his name Peter Tungit. Two bits of bookkeeping before we resume. Hey, NBC News has just hired Peter Tungit. I've got a routine medical procedure later this week. It may lead to the canceling or shortening of the Thursday and Friday episodes. More likely just the shortening. I'll see. I'll keep you posted. Just a little tip in advance. The other news, the first quarter numbers are in. Between podcast downloads and YouTube views, your patronage has already hit 7,467,483. Good work out of you. That's actual watches and listens to like at least half of each program. That averages an audience of about 146,421 per countdown. I do not have figures for those of you who drift in and out. In any event, drifting or not drifting, thank you. I will note that it looks like something like 20, 30% of the daily listeners or the YouTube viewers do not subscribe. Subscribe. What's it to you? You don't have to listen every day. Just subscribe. By the way, these numbers, 146,000 a day and 7.5 million so far this year, these do not include those who just watch the headlines I put out on Twitter X. Okay, back to the actual content. Also of interest here. There are so many candidates for worst persons in the world, I had to give out eight awards, including one to the Republican candidate for state superintendent of schools, who belongs to a group that has insisted that Barack Obama is the grandson of Adolf Hitler. And then there are the real schmucks. That Ronna McDaniel scandal continues at NBC News. The McDaniel scandal. And the clear fall guy, all the arrows are pointing towards him. The clear fall guy is going to be the chairman of NBC News, Cesar Conde. Which means, as I tell you the story, you can call me Brutus. That's next. This is Countdown. This is Countdown with Keith Olbermann. on this all new edition of Countdown. It's one thing if the wheels come off at a place like NBC News, but it's quite another when the wheels 
require more than a full week to come off at a place like NBC News, especially if you don't like NBC News. And I'll now reveal a secret nobody knows. I don't like NBC News. What, that isn't a secret? Oops. There is an executive there named Cesar Conde. He is in charge of NBC News. And because of the Rana McDaniel scandal, he has now been given a suit with a big target on the back. After how he treated me, good. He'd be the fourth head of NBC News I have outlasted. One of them I outlasted, then he came back, and I outlasted him again. Things I promised not to tell next. First, still more idiots to talk about. The daily roundup of the miscreants, morons, and Dunning-Kruger effect specimens who constitute today's worst persons in the world, and I want to welcome you to something historic. Often I have squeezed in more than just three winners, more than just a silver, bronze, and gold, but the pile of morons meriting, nay, demanding recognition in this edition is so vast that I am for the first and maybe last time expanding the award and the award stand to hold not three, not four, not six, but eight different medal winners. Ladies and gentlemen, to quote past winner Jeff Zucker, the supersized edition of the worst persons in the world. In eighth place, the tin award winner, New York City Mayor Eric Adams, God, isn't his term over yet? Plan number three million to improve the subways because the only one that worked that have having the cops on the subways, sometimes in the stations, sometimes on the train. You never knew where or when. It was the element of surprise. They stopped that because of uh, unions. Plan number three million is state-of-the-art weapons scanners. This is our Sputnik moment, said our mayor who fades in and out of this plane of existence. Like when Kennedy said, we're going to put a man on the moon. Let's bring on the scanners. First, Mayor, they're scanners. If they're anything like Apollo spacecraft and we're going to the moon in them, they aren't going to be of much use because they will not stay in one place. Plus, each time you switch them on, they're going to generate 7,600,000 pounds of thrust, which will be a bit of a shock if you're standing next to one of them. Also, I can never tell what Adams knows and what he doesn't, but it sure sounds like he thinks that the American moon mission is the same thing as Sputnik, the satellite, the first to orbit the Earth, which was put up by Russia in 1957, the communists. So when he says this is our Sputnik moment, he's saying this is our communism. I don't know. Does he know Sputnik was not American? Just mention it to him. Somebody mention it to him. I'll lay odds of five to three. The mayor then says, Nick who? In seventh place, your aluminum award winner, Roseanne Barr. Used to be funny. Used to not be particularly crazy. Then came that off-key, crotch-grabbing national anthem at the San Diego Padres game, which was discovered by my producer at Channel 2 in L.A., Ron Grelnick, by the way. And so for the last 34 years, it's been a dice roll with Roseanne. Her newest submission from yesterday, on my way to Mar-a-Lago, to help support the Great Carrie Lake. No, that's, I'm really seeing this. The Great Carrie Lake. We must try to vote our way out of this, Roseanne writes, for at least one last year, and then if that doesn't work, 1776, unquote. I'm just going to skip the idea that Carrie Lake a fired weathercaster who has never held elected office nor come close to winning one is is great at something other than camera filters. My concern here is that little threat at the end of a, quote, 1776, which would be an armed revolution against the duly elected. And she, in fact, in her theorem here, makes it a just re-elected government of the United States. Apart from that being, you know, an illegal threat. See pickup trucks, Roseanne. Roseanne, I do have one question about your 1776 plan if you lose the next election. Who has all the tanks, Roseanne? Bye, Felicia. The Palladium Award for sixth place, me, for a really mean joke. The New York Post put out that, quote, Trump ordered $200 worth of burgers from Long Island Drive-In for flight home after NYPD officers wake. And my response was, what did everybody else have? 
I understood that not only did he eat all of those burgers, he didn't even take off the wrappers first. Fifth place, the zinc medal to the New York Yankees. As part of this continuing melding of pro sports and gambling, which is going real well, ask Shohei Otani. On opening night of the baseball season, on the team Twitter account, the New York Yankees posted a video highlight of a pitcher of theirs named Nestor Cortez, and it read, quote, Nestor settled in, plus 112 to record 5 plus Ks, odds from FD Sportsbook. I recognize those as words and letters in the English alphabet, but I don't know what any of it means. And this is happening while the rest of baseball had suddenly realized, wait, 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 wait. Otani's interpreter got access to Otani's bank account and he was able to wire out $500,000 nine different times. And Otani didn't know. And Otani's business agent didn't know. And Otani's bookkeepers didn't know. And Otani's investment team didn't know. And Otani's banker didn't know. Maybe baseball could lighten up on the gambling hype until we figure out how bad the Otani gambling scandal is. Because whether or not he placed any of the bets, it's still the Otani gambling scandal. How'd the guy get four and a half million dollars out of Otani's bank account? The copper, fourth place, Representative Mike Turner of Ohio. This sentence structure that Turner used is now the main escape hatch for Republicans who want to deny that they are at all responsible for Trump turning their party into a whorehouse. I should say a bigger whorehouse. CBS asked Turner about Trump scamming the gullible with his $60 inscribed Trump McBibles. And Turner answered, quote, You know, I haven't really seen that. I think I'm more concerned about the White House restricting the ability of children to put religious symbols on Easter eggs. Clever Mike Turner, clever whataboutist nonsense. But given that the rule you tried to hit Biden with has been in place since 1976, you'll need to go ask the Gerald Ford White House about this and the Ronald Reagan White House and the H.W. Bush White House about it and W's White House about it. Oh, and the Trump White House about it because they did it, too. In which case, I assume Congressman Turner has his next pivot already. The Trump White House restricting the ability of children to put religious symbols on Easter eggs? You know, I haven't really seen that. Trump could be executing labor leaders on the White House lawn, and these Republican monkeys would claim they had not seen it or heard about it or didn't know anything about those heads rolling down Pennsylvania Avenue from the guillotine center at the Place de la Concorde. The bronze... We're almost done. Worse. Well, how in the hell do you not see this coming? Trump Media. This is your classic pump and dump stock. The company that owns Truth Social, could be renamed Trump's id. The company is worth nearly $7 billion. So it goes public and on day one of trading, its stock reports 2023 revenue of $4 million, but losses of $58 million and the stock drops by 20% before lunch. And the company is now worth not $7 billion, but $6 billion. (gasps) Trump in a scam? The silver, worser, Michelle Morrow, Republican nominee for state superintendent of schools in North Carolina, possibly the worst major candidate the Republicans have ever pulled out of whichever sewer they found her in. She's QAnon. I've already mentioned she believes Jim Carrey drinks the blood of children to look younger, which raises the obvious question. Wait, you think Jim Carrey looks younger? There is, though, a new high in Michelle Morrow low. Media Matters says she has been a self-proclaimed spokesperson for a bag of nut rocks called Liberty First Grassroots. One of whose Facebook postings about President Obama in 2020 read, quote, Hitler bloodlines. Allegedly, Hitler is Obama's grandfather. Show who Barack really was, and everything he did in his presidency will be null and void, unquote. A reminder, there's an easy fix here when it involves superintendents of schools and changing degree requirements and not woke in college. Other states simply must stop accepting North Carolina high school and college degrees as being sufficient for admission to higher education in their states. And yes, I know, I'm talking about education, and I just said sufficient, like I was from Vienna. 
sufficient. But now to our winner, the worst, Charles Johnson, owner of baseball San Francisco Giants. 20 years ago, the Giants sold fans tiles to be placed in the walkway across the cove from their wonderful ballpark in San Francisco. Most fans put the names of loved ones on the tiles, often deceased parents, often parents who have died in the 20 years since. For the last four years, purchasers have not been able to see these often memorial tiles because the area, which features a statue of San Francisco Giants great Willie McCovey, also a former Padres star, has been under construction, reconstruction. The good news, the McCovey statue is in great shape and looks wonderful. The bad news, tile owners got an email from the Giants that informs them, oops, all the tiles have been destroyed. Quote, a digital version of your tile message from the original park will be showcased via a kiosk nearby the McCovey statue. Translation, so no more tiles, but we can show you a picture of what your tile of your dead mother used to look like before we destroyed it over there in that booth. But not anytime soon. More of the email. We will provide another update with more details once the feature is installed. The Giants tell the San Francisco Chronicle they think the kiosk for viewing the destroyed memorial tiles will be open this season, or maybe not. Or given the Giants' recent string of public relations gaffes, maybe never. Who knows? It's hard to say. The owner of the San Francisco Giants, Charles, sorry we destroyed your tile, your mini headstone of your dead parent, but here's a picture of it. Wait, no picture? Check back with us later. June. Uh, no, no, try September. Uh, 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 just to be sure, make it next year. Johnson. Today's worst person in the world. And I nearly listed everybody in the world. the number one story on as i keep hyping this all new edition of countdown and while it is absolutely true that my favorite topic is me my next favorite topic is disasters at nbc news nowhere else have i worked and kid i've worked for all of them nowhere else is there such a culture of ingratitude one that dates back generations like the one there is at nbc news i have watched executives who built the place erased by journeymen whose only skill is claiming for themselves the work of their predecessors and betters. I've watched, inadvertently helped, on-air Frankensteinian ego monsters who will talk to mere mortal reporters about themselves for their own publicity only if their origin stories are not addressed, nor those who got them started even mentioned. So as NBC News continues its second week falling down the proverbial Homer Simpson cliff, over the Rana McDaniel scandal, the McDaniel hiring, and the knives come out for the latest guy running the place, I smile quietly to myself. And when I say I smile quietly, I mean I roar with laughter. So profound. <laughs> I strained muscles. On social media, Someone identifying as Rose of Texas made me roar with such muscle-straining laughter. She wrote, Ronna McDaniel can still be an MSNBC contributor if Mike Pence has courage. I dealt with this Cesar Conde, the chairman of NBC News, who is clearly the one who's going off the cliff when this is over. Not that they haven't all fallen off the cliff. I dealt with Cesar Conde during the conversations to bring me back to resume countdown on MSNBC either at 8 p.m. or as Maddow's caddy four nights a week at 9. Those started in 2019. They stretched wearily across the pandemic. They lasted into late summer 2021, and they were highlighted by one day towards the end when the new CEO of NBC Universal, Jeff Schell, an old friend from my sports days at Fox, finally got his new news chairman, this Conde, to pay attention to his own job for an hour and to meet me to talk the admittedly delicate process to try to make this happen. There were lots of drawbacks, but getting MSNBC viewers it had hemorrhaged 
and profits, it had hemorrhaged even faster. Those were not among the problems. Anywho, on the afternoon of October 8, 2021, Conde's assistant emailed me to set up breakfast. Would a week to the day be good, 8.30 a.m.? I said, uh, yes, it would. As I said, there were obstacles, obvious obstacles I was going to have to overcome. There was going to have to be a certain amount of tail between the legs here for old Keith, and I was not playing hard to get. If his assistant had said, let's meet at 3.30 in the morning, I would have said, dandy, I like to get up early. Seven minutes later, she suggested the bar at a place called the Whitby Hotel for October 15th, kind of equidistant between me and 30 Rock. At the risk of repeating myself, I said, dandy. One minute later, she replied with, apologies, Cesar has a tentative trip that week. That was the next week. This was a Friday. She just discovered that he was going to go away the next week. Let me get back to you, she wrote. This is email number five over a 24-minute span, which Conde's office had itself initiated, and she has just noticed, oh, this thing we've been talking about for 24 minutes, he's out of town. And by the way, they never did get back to me. Mark Shapiro, who negotiated Maddow's $31 million MSNBC deal, told me the next week that she had found out about the breakfast, and Conde had then canceled it. 18 months later, Conde's boss, my old friend Jeff Shell, was fired for prolonged sexual harassment. No severance pay. Didn't get a dime. Started to sue. Dropped the suit. Now, just under a year after that, after the Ronna McDaniel scandal, Puck News reports that the consensus within NBC and NBC News, and more importantly within Comcast, which owns it, is that the McDaniel fiasco transpired because Cesar Conde was too busy devoting himself to his primary professional interest, which is Cesar Conde. To quote Puck, in the context of the McDaniel mess, remembrances of Conde's extracurricular activities have caused journalists at both NBC News and MSNBC to once again question their boss and whether one of America's most storied news organizations <clears throat> should really be run by someone who seems to prioritize his personal and professional advancement over the concerns of the news division he leads. Quote, it's clear he's using the perks of the job for himself one NBC News veteran told me. Is it for corporate purposes or political purposes? I don't know. What I do know is it's never been about us. Unquote. I'll repeat myself from last week. Good night, Cesar Conde, wherever you are. By the way, if you're trying to answer the question, wherever is he? If it's me, I'm checking the bar at that Whitby Hotel first. It's been two and a half years. Do you think Olbermann will ever show up for breakfast? In my decade at NBC, I worked for five different MSNBC chiefs. It was the good guy, Mark Harrington, who got sick. I barely got to know him. They hired me without telling him while he was out sick getting chemotherapy. The next guy who got my support for the job, he was an old friend, by promising me he would let me leave MSNBC while he was promising the folks at 30 Rock that were going to hire him that he would get me to stay... Then there was the six foot five guy who lied to say he was six foot seven, who did not have cable in his home. Then they fired him and they promoted the moron anchor, who they made general manager, who believed that the key was his pet advertising slogan, keeping it real, which was ironic given his hair. And then there was my first producer in TV who had spent the preceding year telling me nobody would ever watch a woman do the news, let alone a gay woman, and who is now president of her production company. At the same time I worked for these five idiots, I worked for three different NBC News chiefs. In reverse order, they were the hysteric whose boss said she fired him after he told her to her face that he would never accept direction from a woman boss. Before him, there was the well-meaning president who wanted me to do a show called Countdown because he liked the name, but he really didn't have any other ideas for it. And then the guy before him, the original guy, Andy Lack. After Andy Lack, who had left to go run Sony into the ground, after Andy Lack returned to running NBC News in 2015, I negotiated with him for about a year to go back and do Countdown there as well. 
This was the running theme of a decade with me and MSNBC. But he had a few provisos. He was the one who wanted me to return to MSNBC. He offered me a job on MSNBC, a show called The Last Word. He offered me the show just as long as I did not do any commentaries or cover any politics. And just as long as I had a a co-anchor, a conservative co-anchor. And just as long as I moved to L.A., even though I could see 30 Rock out my apartment window. Andy Lack reminds me a lot of Cesar Conde, not styles, not personalities. They could not have been more different, except in one vital area. Their job was themselves. I saw Andy Lack about a year ago, walked right past him on the block where I lived. As usual, I heard Andy Lack before I saw him. I met him first in 1997 and spoke to him on the phone a couple of times and realized he was another one of those people you could hear without actually using the phone. Married to this foghorn is his utter fascination with himself. As I saw him approach from the east as my dog and I walked from the west, I tried to make myself small and invisible, but I really had nothing to worry about. As usual, Andy Lack was so absorbed with the sound of his own voice and the brilliant points he was making that I could have blasted, Hello, Andy! at him through a bullhorn, and he would never have noticed. On the other hand, I noticed again that phenomenon of his career and life, that his wife, Betsy, looks a little like every woman anchor he has ever hired. It was Andy Lack who, in his second and final incarnation as the head of NBC News, decided that Megyn Kelly should be brought over from Fox and given a reported $69 million over three years because, well, I forget what he said, but the actual answer was, she looked like his wife when she was younger. As several of my remaining friends at NBC had told me, he had already demoted a couple of the minority anchors on MSNBC to make room for women anchors he liked, who looked like his wife at various stages of her life. He probably never heard any of the racist, stupid, moronic things Megyn Kelly had said on the air, nor any of the warnings he had been given about her, because he was always talking, talking, talking. Makes me look like a mute. Back in 1998 at MSNBC, the little sputtering nightly news magazine show Lack had hired me to do suddenly exploded. We went from literally 70 or 80,000 viewers a night in total to a million, then to a million and a half, then to two million a night, just as long as we continued to mention Bill Clinton and or Monica S. Lewinsky. So after a couple of months of this, I decided to quit. I had just left the office of my new therapist, having spent most of the hour talking about the craziest person I had yet met in broadcasting, Andy Lack, the president of NBC News, when my phone rang out on 23rd Street in New York, and it was Andy Lack. The background here is that the problem, in short, was that we had turned my not-too-successful magazine show of 1997 into the all-Bill Clinton, Monica Lewinsky show of 1998. That there was not enough new news about them every night did not matter. We did at least one show a night, often two, often for two hours each. If Monica Lewinsky's lawyer said anything more detailed than no comment, we stayed on the air until we ran out of guests. The whole thing, including television's crazed wall-to-wall reaction, was a carefully planned Newt Gingrich plot in which he thought he could actually impeach Clinton and then somehow impeach President Al Gore before President Gore could get a new vice president confirmed, which would mean the new new president would be Newt Gingrich. So I wanted out because we were no longer just covering this. We were participating in it. I said, let me leave or let me do something else. Change the topic because I'm done. The problem was every time I said something like, I'm done, or I let my cynicism about the story escape on the air, the ratings went up. The year before, MSNBC was lucky to get 100,000 viewers for one 15-minute period a month. Now we were upset if we did not get a million viewers a minute. MSNBC was actually making money. And that was almost entirely because of my shows. 
So when I wanted to quit, people like Andy Lack wanted not to kill me, but to force me to stay there and keep talking, like that woman who does the news on North Korean television. To make that possible, Andy Lack tried everything. Promises that I and not Brian Williams would be the next anchor of NBC Nightly News once he got rid of Tom Brokaw. More money, time off, threats, threats against my family. Anything except the first step towards letting me change the show or leave it. The first step would have been just talk to me face to face. That was what he was calling to talk about on the warm afternoon of the 27th of May, 1998. How he, how he couldn't talk to me. It was exactly as crazy as it sounds, and it underscored what I saw that Friday evening on my dog walk. You think I can talk? Holy cow! First, I asked Lack if I could come into his office to talk to him about it. He said no. I asked him if we could talk about it on the phone at some point. He said no. Then he proceeded to talk about it. Well, he began, if you're calling about this meaning of life business, if you just want to stir the pot about how you're not satisfied with the show at the moment, and I might add only at the moment, the nuance and subtleties of your career, well, I'd have to say, no, we can't meet. Of course, in saying that, I'm always available to meet with you. I love you. But to me, uh... He paused for no discernible reason, possibly in the desperate attempt to remember what he had just said. In my mind, there now appeared... At the bottom of that news channel ticker that always goes across it, that flashed a message about not worrying about what I would hear next, that all this was just some sort of test of the Andy Lack emergency random thoughts warning system. He suddenly resumed. It's just not the right time. It's premature. It's too early in the process. And in saying it's too early in the process, I'm not saying there is a process. I'm just saying that there shouldn't be a process yet because it's uh, it's just not right the right time for this. And I don't think we've explored the options fully for improving how you see what's happening. And when I say we, of course, I mean you and Phil Griffin, you and Phil Griffin, because Phil's part of this process, not to imply there is a process. But rather, he's just at the beginning of this situation, of the resolution of this situation. Not that this is a situation that requires resolution necessary, because I think you know in life you have many times, many durations, many seasons, many years where you might say you're unhappy or discontented or in some way not pleased with what you're doing. But you'll have plenty of opportunities to make changes in the direction of your life. Obviously not now. You made these changes last year and you committed to it and I committed to it. And you've done such an outstanding job, a thoroughly outstanding job that I can't tell you how much we value you. And I was on Larry King last week and Larry said to me, I love Olderman. And I said, I love Olderman. And he said, I wish I could be doing for you what he's doing for you. And this is not that you should think that I'm totally blowing smoke up your backside, but the critical acclaim especially the insider's critical acclaim, the people whose opinions matter, consistently rating you as the best at this on the cutting edge. And for that matter, the ratings have been outstanding, and I'm fully committed to you in all senses of the word. But if you want to talk to me about in some way changing what you're doing, it just doesn't enter into the equation because things are going so well. And we're just delighted with the program. And you need to understand that on my radar screen, this isn't even on the fast track, because why should I say to you, look, I want to change this completely successful show when it's been such a success and a complete one, and a runaway hit, and everybody says to me how smoothly you've made the transition from sports, and I can't talk to you about it because I love you. I mean, I'm fully behind you 100%, and you have my support and my commitment and my resources, and they're all at your beck and call anytime you need them or you need me, but there aren't problems. And I love the show, and the thought of tinkering with it or adjusting it just is the farthest thing from my mind right now, but you have to understand I'm completely committed to you and Phil and what you're doing, and I just can't talk to you about it now, although the door is always open, and you know you can call me and talk to me at any time about anything. And when I say, I mean uh, anything, I, I don't mean this, and I can't envision changing things because I don't have to. Click. That was Andy Lack, the president of NBC News, talking to me about not talking to me about changing the Clinton Lewinsky TV marathon. It is possible that after all these years, I did not quote his three-minute spasm of words completely accurately, but if I did not, I got damned close. So, the next time Megyn Kelly says something stupid or tweets something stupid, and it's got to be soon, she's due, just remember, don't just blame her. Spread it around. Blame the guy who stuck her on an actual television network with a reputation. Andy lack and say your criticisms of andy lack as loud as you want because just remember he's going to keep talking and he'll never 
hear a word of it. I've done all the damage I can do here. Thank you for listening and bearing with my uh, uncertain voice. Countdown musical directors Brian Ray and John Philip Chanel arranged, produced, and performed most of our music. Mr. Ray was on guitars, bass, and drums. Mr. Chanel handled orchestration and keyboards. It was produced by TKO Brothers and not by Megan Kelly. Other music, including some of the Beethoven compositions, were arranged and performed by the group No Horns Allowed. The sports music is the Olbermann theme from ESPN2, written by Mitch Warren Davis, courtesy of ESPN Inc. Our satirical and pithy musical comments are by Nancy Faust, the best baseball stadium organist ever. Our announcer today was my friend Jonathan Banks. Everything else, pretty much my fault. That's Countdown for this, the 218th day until the 2024 presidential election, the 1,183rd day since demented J. Trump's first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States. Use the 14th Amendment and the not regularly given elector objection option. Use the Insurrection Act. Use the Terrorism Acts. Use the justice system and the mental health system to stop him from doing it again while we still can. The next scheduled countdown is tomorrow. Bulletin says the news warrants. Till then, I'm Keith Olderman. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, and good luck. Good luck.